Hajj is a key pillar of Islam. What, why is that the case? Hajj is phenomenal because it brings together aspects of the different forms of worship. We regard them as the five pillars of Islam, commencing with the Shahada, so the testimony that you believe in Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, peace be upon him, and then Salah as prayer, Zakah as alms giving or charity, uh, Siyam as fasting. The unique thing about Hajj is it brings together aspects that are found standalone in each of these forms of worship. So if you look at prayer, prayer is predominantly physical. We look at Siyam or fasting, it's predominantly geared around self-restraint and self-mastery. And then if we look at Zakah or alms giving, it's financial or economic. Now Hajj brings together aspects of all of these. And this truly unites the soul in a sense of one cherishes every moment spent during these days of the trip because all these standalone acts of worship like prayer done five times a day, fasting over a period of 30 days once a year and then zakah uh, executed once a year. One gets to celebrate all of this in a very short space mm -hmm. of time and also gets to celebrate all of this not individually where prayer can be observed individually, though it's better in congregation. Um, fasting can be observed individually, though people are all fasting at the same time. But here, it's all the different aspects, emotional, psychological, physical, financial, spiritual, self-mastery, brought together, together with people who are representative of the Muslim population from every part of the globe. It's interesting you say, you say Muslim because Ibrahim salam, or Abraham is, is revered as a prophet in the Islamic faith. But the injunction, I understand, from the Qur'an is, is to him. Explain that. So the ayah in Qur'an in the surah, or the chapter known as the chapter of Hajj, وَأَذِّنْ بِالنَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَىٰ كُلِّ ضَامِرِ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجِنْ عَمِيرٍ is where Allah instructed Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, Ibrahim alayhi salam, to invite people to this spectacle. And this spectacle is based on one prerequisite. And that prerequisite is Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So while he was a, a prophet that uh, people from other aspersions also seem to take as, as credible uh, as a reference point, it's the fact that in this day and age, in terms of pure monotheism and tawheed, it is only the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, who still uphold this. So it's an injunction that then becomes one that's kind of exclusive mm -hmm. to the people who follow Muhammad and, and, and what is it, I often hear people speak at length about being drawn to this Hajj and, and, and the majesty uh, and, and the spiritual connection about being there. You know, describe that, you know, what, 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 what's the connection of the Hajj to the believer? The connection is, as we've mentioned, all these different aspects. So one gets a certain sense of fulfillment from doing things that are physical, like somebody who goes to gym. At the end of a workout, he feels, I've achieved something. Mm. One gets some satisfaction from being able to be resilient over a period of time. And one would be able to achieve that from fasting one feels a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment uh, and upliftment by virtue of being able to reach into his pocket or his purse or her purse and uh, give out some charity. Now Hajj brings all of these together over this short period of time and that's why one is drawn to it. It's mm. almost as if one could say that after undertaking Hajj once, it's a drug. Fortunately, it's one that's addictive but not one that's counterproductive to your health. So well, it's a you know, very halal addiction. What then is that high? When you, when you have this addiction, what is the high that, that one brings home? The high is that one realizes that if one has managed to achieve Allah on his side and one has this relationship with his creator, then there's nothing that can stop that human being from realizing his full potential. There are many other fads that we encounter in our life in terms of you know, self-help, self-discovery, etc., etc. They last for a period of time. But then one needs a new addiction. And one needs to satisfy the soul with a new craving. The difference with Hajj is it's connected to the transcendental. And that means that Allah was from the beginning of time and will be till beyond the end of time. And hence, one will always want more and more and more of this Hajj. Why, why can't the Hajj be held in other countries? Why? In, in Mecca, in, in, in Arabia specifically. So Allah has made it such that this land, referred to in Quran as Ummul Qura, the mother of the cities, is truly the navel of the earth from a geographical perspective and also from a historical perspective. That if we look at all the prophets who came from the time of Prophet Adam, uh, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, all the way to the last and the seal of Prophets Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one would find that all of them journeyed and spent some time 
in this land. So it's the high that we spoke about earlier on is not only around uh, spiritual fulfillment, but it's connecting you with the legacy of the human race from its very inception. And, and there are like four or five components that make up the Hajj uh, all around the, the region of Makkah. What, if you can tell us very really quickly, what, what are they? So the components that make up the Hajj are, or some of the rites of the Hajj would be um, the Tawaf, so the circum circumambulation around the Kaaba, the black cube box that we all know about and see on our screens all the time, uh, and then running between the hillocks of Safa and Marwa. This is emulating the practice of the wife of Abraham, peace be upon him, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Hajar, when she ran looking for water. Um, the next would be spending time in what in this modern age is known as Ten City, Mina, where people used to camp from pre-Islamic times uh, in the face of Ukaz and people would go about presenting their thoughts and ideas of where the world should move. And this is a gathering that also becomes a very big part of Hajj. The pinnacle of Hajj is the gathering on Arafah, which is almost dress rehearsal for the last day, the day when we will have to give account before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And coupled with this then, one returns towards closer to the Kaaba and spends time for one evening uh, in a little area known as Muzdalifa, a valley between many mountains and many hills. These are some of the key points that one will spend time on in Hajj and each of these have their own rites and rituals that are fulfilled within prescribed times. And, and this point of, of Arafah, uh, the, this valley you speak about, is it, is it true that that's where the world will congregate one day on the Day of Judgment? Well, this is not essentially where the world will congregate per se, but it's the closest you're going to get to an understanding of what it will be on that remarkable day when everything will be put in front of us in terms of how the entire human race has spent their life and will be called to account for it. And it is Hajj a, a test, like an examination that you have to go through, or is it in fact a reward for work done before the Hajj? Hajj is, is both. Number one, it's, it's a reward for the fact that you have strived and hence in your, your striving, in your individual submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have carried His favor and He has extended this invite to you. And it's also preparation for almost everything that one will encounter in the rest of one's life until you breathe your very last and return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, therefore, a, a person who wants to know more about the Hajj and says, well, describe the Hajj for me in one soundbite sentence. What would you say? Hajj is the ultimate journey to your Creator.